I, I hope I can live up to that. OK. Um, hey, so I got I to stay inside of frame here, I believe, right? Yeah, I got to stay inside of frame here. So I don't get to be as animated as I, as I want to be. Uh, so I will try to make up for it by being uh, extra loud, if I can, maybe. Um, so uh, it's kind of fitting that, uh, that the first thing that we uh, were looking at was uh, next week, uh, next Wednesday, the Python group's going to be talking about data visualization, sort of what I'm going to be actually talking to you uh, a bit today uh, about, uh, moving beyond data visualization. So kind of a, a way of where can we take data visualization uh, next. Um, as, as Jacob mentioned, I, uh, uh, so I spoke on this exact same topic uh, at uh, TEDx OU back in February, I think it was, January, February, something like that, a few months ago. January? January. Awesome. Thank you. Better memory than I have. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, hopefully it's that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I uh, spoke at TEDx OU uh, back in January on this exact same topic uh, that I'm going to talk to you guys about today, although uh, we get to kind of have the ability to talk a little bit differently about it. So I was speaking in front of a uh, speaking in front of a group of uh, that where I wanted to make this as relatively non-technical as possible, kind of talk about the capabilities and sort of the philosophy and that sort of thing. And if you're interested in that, quick YouTube search or you ask either of us, we know how to get to it. Um, but you, you know, you can you can go watch that uh, uh, if if you happen to be interested in, in that sort of version of it. Uh, the other side of it is that, you know, being sort of Ted with the lights and the lasers and that sort of thing, like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to can most of the theatrics involved in that sort of thing around this, where we have the ability to sort of discuss a little more from the, the technical perspective and, and like the technical implementation and, and that sort of thing, uh, you know, given we're the, with a different group. But with that in mind, um, the, uh, the other thing I will mention is, uh, and I'll kind of mention as I go through in, in, in a sort of high amount of disclosure, uh, this subject is very much what the uh, the company that I work for uh, does. I don't mean this to necessarily be an, you know, an ad for the company I work for, uh, which is called Exaptive, um, but it's but our company is based around this type of philosophy. So it's not going to surprise you that this is where uh, one of my sort of you know primary uh, uh, professional interests is at. So. I say moving beyond uh, uh, data visualization, and, and really the, the main pieces that I want to talk about, and I got some notes here to use as a crutch in case I need to. The main thing I really want to uh, to talk about is how do we uh, how do we leverage uh, the underlying sort of capabilities of us as people and our sort of users uh, as people to make data visualization more uh, effective. And I start off by showing. Uh, uh, this particular uh, this particular picture. I love this picture. Um, it's a really cool uh, uh, picture that tells us a lot about our humanity. That tells us a lot about why our eyes are in the middle of our head uh, instead of off to the side, the way a bunch of uh, uh, grass-eating animals uh, are. It tells us about uh, what really is is responsible for a key aspect of our uh, capability as humans, and surprisingly, this is responsible for uh, a lot of why data visualization works in the first place. Uh, reading a whole bunch of numbers is not really very effective. You have to kind of conceptualize all of those concepts, and yet this is what it comes down to. It you know a couple million squares of uh, various shades of like yellow and brown, and a couple of greens here and there. And yet, instantly, you know exactly what it is because we grew up, you know, we, sorry, like we evolved in an area where there were monsters in the world. Monsters are real things. And if you saw one of these, you have to run away immediately or, or be a story for your village uh, about when you used to be uh, at all. Um, and so we get, got as, as sort of, you know, cognitively, one of the things that we are amazingly good at as people as humans is finding uh, patterns, particularly visual patterns. Our, our eyes by a vast majority are stronger than the other four senses. And, and so our, our, our visual uh, pattern recognition capability is, is extraordinarily uh, acute. The way I think about it, a, a good sort of analogy I like to give around it is that, uh, you know, you could have a million dollars worth of, of you, know, t you know, hardware, computing all kinds of every deep network thing that you have you know, ever thought of, and it could not uh, as effectively get as much information out of this picture as a three-year-old girl could uh, who has never even been through education, like as just you can have uh, 
built into uh, our brain evolutionarily. And, and in the opposite of that, if you were to, you know, if I were to take my, if I were to take my phone and drop it on the ground, it could successfully do more linear algebra before it hit the ground than I'd be capable of doing by hand for the rest of my life. Um, so there are some things that we are so much more highly effective uh, at being able to do that, uh, that sort of the magic black box data science techniques have not really been able to replicate, but that's not really terribly important. What actually I think is, is that uh, we kind of have the, the capability to leverage uh, uh, those capabilities, you know, leverage sort of the pattern recognition in, 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 in the way that we want to communicate uh, patterns. And so I try to generalize this specifically into the area of uh, data analysis. I'm a data analyst, I'm a, I'm a data scientist. Uh, I sort of work in, in this sort of area. And I am in the same way that if I was, you know, if I was in the Bangladesh uh, uh, jungle and I saw this tiger, like I am taking a bunch of individual facts and I am creating from the you know, patterns that I'm putting on top of them. And I am creating information uh, that I want to learn something, hopefully quickly in this case, but I'm learning information from those uh, set of individual uh, facts. And I, I, I want to be able to draw an analogy to, to data analysis in, in that particular way. I'm taking a number of individual facts and I want to be able to create and understand some sort of pattern. And sometimes I'm going to be able to do that entirely algorithmically. And I'm going to hand it off to some other process and it's going to do something with it. And a person never sees it. But quite often, uh, a person is going to need to see it, or I want a person to be able uh, to, you know, I want to communicate whatever patterns are either found or capable of being found uh, to a person. So this is, I think, is, is what has led us to sort of the, the current state of data visualization, in, in my opinion. Um, and I think the current state of data visualization is, is actually really good. I don't think we've done anything materially wrong. I don't think we've headed down the wrong path. I just think we're ready to continue to move forward. This is the dashboard. Uh, every, everybody seen these? Like, the, you know, we, we, we use these for, for different things. These are sort of thought of as where you want to get to. If you're doing some sort of data analytic task, um, this is sort of how you know you're done. Once you get to one of these, you, you know, the pretty standard data visualizations, they're standard for a reason. They're, they're all based on, we're really good at distinguishing color, we're really good at distinguishing differences in distance, we're really good at sort of looking for patterns, whether things are going up or down, or sort of, uh, you know, all, all uh, uh, kind of crazy or all kind of unchanged. Uh, we're not quite as good at seeing like differential proportion kind of pie chart style, telling which slices how much thicker than the other, but we're decent at it. Uh, but we're sort of really good at seeing differential distance, how, you know, how far along uh, some sort of path are we. And so that's, you know, a, a take that and, uh, you know, 75 or, or, or 80 years worth of, of uh, kind of industrial art. And that's how we get to um, the, the dashboards. And, and, and really, you know, the, these have not materially changed a ton. Uh, over the past 60 to 75 years. They certainly have, they've gotten more beautiful, they've gotten more sort of slightly more interactive, they've gotten uh, where they can be created a whole lot easier, they're no longer only in paper, uh, they quite often have very you know, good colors, they're on screens, they're on big flat screens, they're on big flat 4K screens, like they keep getting, they keep getting better and, and slightly more effective, but the paradigm has not characteristically changed and that's sort of uh, the, the, the argument that I want to, to make from an underlying basis. So this is um, this is a, a, a model um, of a particular, I believe it's a protein um, of some kind. Um, the entire purpose behind this is, is I want to uh, get sort of out of the, of the dashboard mentality when it is not necessary to use. So it's quite often very useful to use, but in, in there, when there are places where we want people to be able to find these types of patterns, I want to make um, data visualization that can start to capture more capabilities of what we are insanely good at as humans, as people, you know, as, as, as you know, bags that carry brains around, like what our brains are insanely good at. And one of the things they are insanely good at is being able to uh, find visual patterns. But the other thing is that we are, we're pretty social. Uh, we like to go discover things. We like to go explore things. 
And we actually like to collaborate to build things bigger than ourselves when we feel like we have the capability to and when we feel like uh, we can, can be effective at doing it. We feel like we, we have the, uh, the ability to understand you know, how our contribution can, can matter. And the way I think this manifests itself, my particular opinion, the way I think this manifests itself in a, a data analysis context is building interactive data applications. Um, so the company that I work for, Exaptive, this is, is, this is sort of a, a primary base of our mission. This thing was not built in, in, our, in our world. Uh, a number of the most famous examples of, of data applications were not either. This is a pretty tool agnostic idea. Um, uh, in fact, there's probably elements of this that are going to show up on Wednesday. If you come back, if you come back for, uh, for Wednesday pizza again uh, to, see, to see Mike and co, uh, uh, to see the Python group, uh, probably be talking about things that echo a lot of, uh, of these sentiments. And, uh, the, but the reason I, I think we actually need full, you know, the, the, the difference I think I draw between a visualization and an application is the role to which you as the user uh, have. So in a visualization, uh, go, there we go. In a visualization like this, you're mostly a consumer. Uh, this is, you know, this is this is television. You, you're you're sort of watching it. There's some types of interactions starting to get, you know, this is starting to move a little bit more in, in that direction, but it's moving very incrementally. And I want to sort of spar it, to shock it, to move it uh, uh, in that direction to a great degree, rather than just a you know click on a bar to filter uh, type of incremental degree. I want us to, uh, to be able to, uh, to go a whole lot uh, further. So I do want to show you uh, an application that, uh, that we did uh, build. I think I have to hit it again to get it to start playing. Uh, so this is an application that um, happened to be built on our platform, but that, that is, is, is pretty agnostic to this discussion. Uh, but this is uh, around exploring a, a model that was derived from uh, curating uh, a few hundred papers on neurophysiological disease, primarily people who had traumatic brain injury or who had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and then associated things beside it. So major depressive disorder, suicidality, and the kind of entire environment of research in that area, the genetic level research, the longitudinal research, a number of different things. And what we were trying to do was find a way to explore uh, the fact patterns that research has, has sort of discovered in, in this particular area uh, over the past uh, maybe 10-ish years, 10 to 12-ish years, uh, but be able to uh, give the capability to uh, explore these. And, and the individual uh, kind of fact aspects that were found, there are about 2,100 aspects that were found, which meant if you wanted to look at uh, pathways, fact pattern pathways uh, throughout this particular area, you had even just in a three hop uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a network of how, what is related to what. If you were to look at pathways of what was related to what, even just three steps apart of your own research, you had about 41 million possible pathways. There's no amount of bar charts that you can use to be able to show that in, uh, in an effective way. And the only way, the way that we, you know, we couldn't solve this algorithmically. You can't remotely solve it algorithmically. There wasn't a question to ask that we could go find an answer to. There were people who were science writers that wanted something fundamentally different out of this data than people who were genetic researchers, longitudinal researchers, or funders, uh, like philanthropic funders of, of uh, neurophysiological research. And they all wanted to ask sort of different questions. And so instead of us trying to build something to answer a specific question, what we wanted to be able to do was to build something that allowed you to sort of interrogate uh, the world using data visualization capabilities, but interrogate and explore throughout this world. We wanted to give people the ability to explore because people like to do that. We wanted to give people the ability to collaborate, which you don't really see in this particular uh, video of people literally collaborating, but we wanted to give people the ability to collaborate and understand. Uh, what each other were, were looking at and where there were collaboration opportunities between each other. We wanted to give the people, and we wanted to give people the ability to use their pattern recognition, use their domain knowledge in, in, in a particularly uh, effective way. And so that was all about trying to make something interactive and trying to make it um, discoverable. The example that I love to give around why uh, I think data visualization and data science in general uh, needs to start to look at the capabilities of what technology has brought us to be uh, more collaborative 
And my, my canonical example for this is, is Wikipedia. Uh, so I think Wikipedia is sort of the, one of the first um, examples I can think of of like a completely public zeitgeist version of a, what do you think of it as a data application? Now it's a little rough to sort of think of it as a data application. I might be going just a little bit out on a, a limb to think of it that way because the data aspect uh, of Wikipedia is super simple. It, it's just text. You read it like a book. Uh, you know, you can search for, you can look for individual pieces of text. So the data challenge behind Wikipedia is uh, insanely simple. Any of us could build the data aspect of Wikipedia before the end of today, no big deal. But what Wikipedia uh, did, or what I think is the lesson to, to learn from the success of Wikipedia, is the extent to which uh, it's, it destroyed the barriers of effective collaboration around document making. And it's kind of fitting that it was so soon after the technology was invented, essentially no one had ever heard of the technology when we decided to get a project off the ground of, well, you know, we have this really effective way of creating interrelated uh, documents that everyone can collaborate on. Let's just, uh, let's try to make a document about everything we know as people. Like, let's just, let's just make a document about all everything. And every, everything from like scientific principles of like how cell mitosis works all the way to like uh, the Justin Bieber album ratings, like every single thing. Uh, the sort of we are capable of knowing in any sort of collective way as people, let's try to, to get it in here. And the way that I like to look, so, so there's, there's, there's cool ways to look at the scale of Wikipedia. I think as of about a year ago, if you, uh, if you printed it all out in the same font size and like a volume size as uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, that's about how big it is, about the size of, my, my characterization of it is about the size of a small motel. Um, so you certainly can't, you know, I, but I, I think the more fun way to think about it is to restrict ourselves entirely, um, entirely within the, uh, the amount of Wikipedia that uh, relates to Star Trek. So I'm going to have to consult the, the notes on this particular part because I've forgotten the individual uh, numbers. And I want to get the numbers uh, correct. So uh, yeah, so when the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, first was, uh, was released, uh, it was a little bit shy of 2,400 pages uh, across, I think it was four volumes, um, a little bit shy of 2,400 pages. It took a number of people a number of years uh, to, uh, to put that whole thing together, and it was originally envisioned as being, they called it, this word encyclopedia hadn't really been used in this way yet, uh, they used it to mean uh, a dictionary of human knowledge, and they you know, went everywhere trying to collect uh, this human knowledge with these professional curators. Uh, but if you look at the part of Wikipedia today that is only related to Star Trek, it is roughly 12% larger by text size than the original edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, all within about a hundred year span. And so the, <laughs> The, the, the way I say it, and I, I mean it to be as theatrical as possible, the way I, 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 you know, I say it in sort of the original version of this is to say that sounds, you know, depressing. I don't want you to think of it as depressing. I want you to think of it as inspiring because we were willing, we, we destroyed enough barriers in the capability of easy, effective collaboration. We were willing to put as much thought into a relatively obscure television show from the 1960s as humanity kind of was in general the first time they made the sort of most famous attempt to collect uh, all of, of, of human curated knowledge. And I, 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 I think that's a very inspiring thing in a cheeky way. Uh, in a fun way, but I think that's a very uh, uh, sort of uh, inspiring way. And keep in mind, um, everybody who did it was a volunteer. Nobody got paid. We all did it for free. Everybody did it in our spare time. Like that's how effect, ma making collaboration uh, so effective, removing all of the sort of cost of collaboration, uh, we would become, you know, we, we would be very surprised to what extent people are willing to, uh, to, to sort of give away their time and their effort and their capability if they feel like they can build something bigger. Now, making that point in front of this particular group is wholly unnecessary because uh, this is a group that knows what Linux is and Linux is way larger than, than Star Trek Wikipedia. It might even be bigger than Wikipedia in general, I'm not sure. In pure lines of text, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, but this is, this, is, this is Linux, this is Hadoop, this is Spark, this is 
all like 800 tools that are with Hadoop now, however many there are, that are all named after animals, except for three of them for no reason. This is every, yeah, th 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 this, is, this, is modern, uh, this is modern software in, in, in a number of ways. Uh, is, is both largely comprised of, uh, of sort of open source projects. And Wikipedia, in a way, is just open source knowledge. It's not, it's not anything very crazy around there. But uh, do we think we would have, you know, the, the, the killer app behind making an encyclopedia of the world's knowledge was Wikipedia. Uh, was, I mean, it wasn't Wikipedia, it was Wiki. It was the Wiki technology. The killer app behind uh, being able to have modern grade uh, open source projects uh, is, is definitely getting GitHub. Um, and it, in some ways, I, I think you, you know, it's, it's, it's got a lot of technical barriers, but it is, at its basis, uh, I would argue is a, is a data uh, application. It's a data management curation application, uh, but it is a data uh, uh, application. And I want to bring those capabilities into uh, into data uh, analysis and particularly into the way that data analysis communicates with the world. The way that data analysis um, uh, becomes a, a, a lens on the world. So the, the example that I love to give, I love to go back and pick on dashboards. I, I, you know, I, love to, I love to pick, dashboards are fun to pick on, especially with front of, you know, front of nerdy people. They like to pick on dashboards too because everyone, everyone sort of wants a dashboard for everything but they don't really know what they want to answer. Um, but the, the, the thing I love about, uh, you know, the, the, the way I like to pick on dashboards is I say it's, it's a wholly fitting name. Because uh, I have a dashboard in my car and I use it in the exact same way. I want to see, like, you know, uh, do, I, you know, do I have gas and, like, how fast am I going too fast? And, and uh, you know, are, like, are the lights, you know, not on bright when I don't want them to be? And, like, is the engine, you know, like, still in there or whatever? And, and, and I, I use it, as, but I don't, like, drive by just looking at the dashboard the whole time. Uh, I would run into something immediately. Like I, I use the windshield. I go out and explore. You know, I use it to sort of as my protection to go out and explore the world. And so I say, like, I don't want to get rid of the dashboard. And it has its. It is you know, incredibly useful for what it's you know for what it is used for. I want to add a windshield. I want to create a windshield, and and I want data visualization to understand how do we create these explorable worlds where where people could go um, you know could go pick up. Uh, data, look at it, uh, collaborate with other with other people uh, around it. Um, let me see. So, yeah, that's all I've got on that side. I'll put it back to black so it's less in the way. So, um, in as much as I kind of have like a, a conclusion to wrap around this, in as much as I can sort of, you know, I repeat myself <laughs> one last time. Um, is um, is to is to basically say uh, we've kind of we've sort of solved the small problems, and we've kind of solved a lot of the fun problems. Uh, you know, Wikipedia, Star Trek, etc. Uh, but we are kind of getting to the point where our our sort of hybrid capabilities as as people and our hybrid capabilities with the technology that we have invented is on the cusp of really being able to solve what I think are some of the grand challenges of humanity. Uh, challenges that, that were, are on par, uh, on par uh, with, with things like curing polio. Um, and uh, I, I think some of the grand challenges of, of humanity around things like cancer and, and, and neurological disease. And um, these things are going to, they are not going to be uh, um, necessarily solved by algorithms. They're going to, the algorithms are going to be the tools, but they're not going to be the savior. Uh, if they had, we, we would have seen it by now, or we would see that somebody solved some subset uh, of these, and largely that has not been the case. Uh, but as we start to understand, you know, as we start to understand humanity on a genetic level, we sort of start to understand, you know, humanity with a greater uh, extent than, than sort of our own cellular biology does. And dealing with that kind of amount of data is going to sort of open up the ability for us to have a shot at kind of challenging the, a shot, a shot at being able to solve, you know, sort of what I think of as, as the grand challenges of humanity, of finding from that individual data, being able to find uh, the patterns necessary to sort of, you know, take, you know, what we've done so far has taken us from uh, a life expectancy of, uh, of 35, you know, up into uh, knocking on the door of 80. 
and to take us from you know uh, from 80 to 150 is going to is going to take us you know being able to uh, to go a whole lot further. It's going to take us being able to leverage actually uh, what we are as you know, as as people. Uh, in order to be able to understand systems that are, like, you know, like I said in the very beginning, systems that are not uh, that are not as as um, you know as, as intelligent as a three-year-old uh, yet, in some regards, and are are more intelligent uh, in the matter of seconds than the entirety of humanity uh, could be in a century in other regards. And so, uh, being able to effectively hybridize our capabilities as people. I think is the key to to being able to uh, systematically take on a lot of these sort of grand challenges of humanity uh, outside of just predicting the stock market. So with that, that's all the kind of prepared, how are we doing on time? Oh man, that was a lot longer than I thought it would be. You can be wrapped up. I will talk for way longer than you want me to. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's kind of the, the sort of main thing that I kind of wanted to just sort of throw out on the table. Um, more or less want to sort of open up. Anybody wants to s tell me I'm wrong or dumb or what did you think about this or somebody's already solved all that, that problem for you or anything at all? Anybody wants more pizza? Now's a good time too. <laughs> Um, okay, so so for for the for the people out there in in Streamland, uh, I'm going to repeat your question. So you're you're a BI developer and you're used to uh, building uh, kind of dashboards, traditional data uh, visualization uh, tools, and for for people and uh, you know people kind of want dashboards for uh, everything, but they don't necessarily know what questions they really want to ask. Um, how do you like how, how does how does this play into that world? Is that is that a fair way of repeating your question? Great. Um, uh, when, when people sort of ask for dashboards for everything, I think what they're asking for is uh, is control. Uh, so I worked for um, um, I, I worked for a, a, an enterprise grade company with with Mark over over at Sonic, over at Sonic Corporate for a number of years, and the exact same pattern. That's a, that's a normal corporate pattern. It's a normal pattern of tiny companies too. It, it, it's uh, people want to be able to understand. They want to be able to uh, understand what's what's going on. They want to sort of cover bases. And quite often, when people ask for uh, some sort of analytic, um, what they really wanted or what they sort of knew was going to happen was it was going to show them nothing. But now they knew that that nothing existed. Uh, they knew that they could, you know, they had a check on making sure that nothing existed. And uh, at its core, people wanted, uh, they wanted control, they wanted understanding, they wanted to fundamentally understand. And if there are, you know, 15 things that are subject to uh, being what you need to understand, building a dashboard on the three that the black box tells you are the most likely to cause the thing doesn't necessarily make you feel better about, well, what do the other 12 mean? And, and so giving people the ability to easily go find out what are the other 12 and let me just like, let me get my own eyes, let me get my own brain uh, wrapped around the fact that this is not necessarily what matters or maybe it is and we did, weren't capturing it in the right way, but giving people you know, the, the, the power of, of the ability to sort of understand those questions in the same way that they could ask them like changes it, it it yeah it changes uh, a lot of um, a lot of, of of that stuff yeah it, it it removes that apprehension and that apprehension quite often leads to is like well I need to be able to see everything so build this and build this and build this and it sort of follows the zeitgeist of what they don't feel like they have enough control over right now um, whereas giving giving over uh, the sort of explorability of that control. Um, completely removes that completely removes that apprehension and then 
you know, then you have dashboards on things that are actually literally things that, that matter, like our server's going to crash, and how's the database doing, and, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, are, you know are, are things, how are things flowing, and that sort of things that are very natural, you know, dashboard speedometer taco sort of things. So, yeah. For sure. Well, usually whoever does the first one, like, opens up the next six. Oh, man. Yeah. So yeah, when I'm talking to somebody who uh, who's trying to identify like what dashboard or visualization to build, how do I how do I go about doing that? Uh, I try to concentrate as much as possible on getting a precursory knowledge of the data itself. How does the data work? How is it structured? Where does it come from? What does it kind of mean to the extent that I'm capable of understanding what it means? Like, that whole thing, uh, that application that I showed you that was all about uh, like different genetics tests and you know, the protein expression, I don't understand how any of that actually works. But I understood, uh, oh, whenever you see one of these, this means it's a protein and this means it's a gene and I could kind of, you know, you know, I, I could kind of get just enough Wikipedia knowledge that when they were asking questions, I knew how to, you know, strike in on the keywords. Um, so the first thing is just being able to fundamentally understand pretty normal data science -y type stuff, being able to understand uh, the data, being able to understand just enough of the domain that I can talk to the people who literally understand the domain and like we're not going to get wires crossed. It's just going to, it's just going to be mildly frustrating on their part rather than, you know, ships passing in the night. Once you can kind of get there, um, beyond that, I would sort of start to kind of open up on top of it around uh, trying to figure out what types of, of questions theoretically are answerable based on this. Does it mean anything to know what's connected to something else? Does it mean anything to know sort of the, 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 you know, the relationships over time or the relationships uh, sort of between like cardinality, how frequent something is versus uh, you know, versus sort of, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's peers, if you will. And so once you kind of got some of those pieces, uh, we would try to pretty rapidly iterate around very dirty versions of those things where you could kind of look at those. And, and really, you know, 80% of them were like, eh, not really or not so much. But a good 20% of those were like, oh, okay, like, but if I could, and quite often they weren't actually what people wanted, but they kind of gave people license to dream in a way around like, okay, you know, I mean, really what I'm trying to figure out is like, whenever this type of pattern occurs, and they sort of walk through that type of thing, and then that was sort of lead us in you know, that rapid iteration, uh, and just making something explorable and just, you know, making it barely explorable made you want to see a little more. And then making a little more make, made you want to see uh, you know, made you sort of want to go beyond it and figuring out, you know, doing that with, with two or three or four people who had kind of different, uh, um, like, perspectives would sort of make them, like, figure out, like, how maybe they would want to collaborate or to what extent would they even want to collaborate and in what regard. And so, yeah, it, it, it was all about getting something tangible and triggering that sort of exploration. And then the ideas would, would sort of flow. But when, nothing, when it's a blank sheet of paper, when it's a you know, blank screen, you kind of had to envision, you sort of envision the thing you already know. But if we, if we forced somebody to see something in a way they weren't literally used to seeing, uh, that would almost never be what they literally wanted. But it would be a really good like, okay, but, and then, and then we'd start listening. And yeah, everything sort of went from, from there um, uh, like a, like a conversation, yeah. <laughs> Sir. Okay. Sure. Okay. So the answer to your first question, uh, is to repeat the question, it sounds like uh, building these sort of applications, um, or you know, the ability to build applications like this relies on a high degree of, of data validity and, and integrity, and uh, you know, how, do you, how do you handle it if you don't have uh, a high data you know, integrity and validity? So the answer to the first question is not necessarily. Uh, do, you know, is it necessary to have a high degree of data integrity and, and validity? Uh, in order to um, in order to be able to build effective data applications, uh, my objective answer would be uh, or my objective answer is 
uh, it, that isn't necessarily uh, required. And my subjective answer is, for my sake, I kind of hope not. Um, because in, in my experience, uh, there's tons of issues, like data, data cleanliness, like everybody, everybody's like kind of remembering data cleanliness horror stories in their head right now. I, so th this is a thing that, that exists throughout uh, th this, this entire, any sort of data analytics world. And I think one of the more effective ways to be able to, to clean it up is to couple it with, uh, with the ability to have kind of exploratory and collaborative pattern finding. Because uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, that an application is more, you know, it's a two-way two connection. Uh, it's capable of being a two-way connection. It's a, you know, it's an internet, not a television. Um, is that uh, it can be a very effective way of finding and correcting uh, data validity and data uh, problems. So I think that is actually a really good use case for data applications is improving data validity, improving data cleanliness, quality, et cetera. Um, so in that regard, that's why I say not necessarily. Now, if the purpose of the application that you are building or the dashboard or just a number that's like the average of this value, you know, the average sales were $12. Like whatever the thing is that you're trying to get to, whatever the answer is in your head at the moment, if it is making data validity assumptions, if it needs to make data validity and data cleanliness assumptions, then yeah, it's, it is very much a, is very much a, a, a problem um, in the same way it would be for, for anything. And in so much as an application kind of allows a high degree of freedom on what conclusions to draw and how to kind of build the pieces in your head of what questions you want to answer, then there's more opportunities for those to be wrong. And uh, yeah, it ends up being at a minimum as big of a problem in this area as it does everywhere else. But, I, but my real answer behind that is, is uh, I think this is, as, as, as much as it is like the least sexy use of like all of the sort of interactive, explorable, grand challenges of you know, humanity sort of this stuff, um, I, think, I think this particular paradigm can be a very highly effective way of, of solving that crucial, even though it's not as much fun to talk about problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sure. So, uh, can I can I give a can I give an example of the technologies used to um, to solve the, the the stuff that we did uh, for that application that I showed from from Exaptive? Those the blue the blue video. Um, yeah. So uh, so that was built in in uh, in our Exaptive uh, platform. Um, the underlying technologies uh, that are honestly completely agnostic uh, of, of our platform. Uh, that was used, they used uh, two databases, it uses MySQL database um, to sort of store cached information and it used a Neo4j uh, graph database to store the, the items and the relationships between them. Um, both we were just hitting with, with, uh, with their standard APIs and, and drivers. The application itself was a completely a web app, uh, so it was running on the, uh, it was running on, on a, um, a JavaScript front end, so a complete JavaScript front end. Uh, all of this sort of hot interactions, all of the hover and it turns blue sort of stuff, or ch the color changes, all of that stuff is, is uh, JavaScript, the vast majority of it, um, uh, D3 uh, oriented stuff. A little bit of it's not, but most of it's sort of, you know, uh, D3 off the shelf type stuff. A lot of the sort of algorithmic stuff that we were doing uh, around responding to things that needed to talk to the database, that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of that was uh, running on, um, uh, was running in uh, uh, Python uh, code that, uh, that was running on a, uh, a server and was just talking using uh, Ajax and WebSockets back to the front end. All of that is, is, is pretty agnostic of our, uh, of, of our Exaptive platform. The Exaptive platform, the sort of my company aspect of it, um, is all around the compatibility layer, making all those pieces uh, talk to each other. So, how to make when you hover on one thing, uh, you know, talk to, you know, tell that it needs to go template a string and then hand that string off to a to a database connector that talks to the API that then takes that data. All all of those like uh, uh, compatibility layer stuff. That's uh, at a core. That's what uh, our platform is. Just that compatibility layer. So, 
you could build every single aspect of that uh, application in the absence uh, of our platform. It's a, it's a web app that's largely running client side from uh, pretty standard databases. So. Mark. So what visualization like types or techniques have uh, have we have we used that are really more effective uh, the, the you know the most effective ones um, in 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 my sort of uh, uh, experience the things that are the most effective are the things that are sort of the most responsive uh, the things that feel like they have a lot of depth to them so there's a reason why you know there's a reason why you can find data visualization books from the 20s uh, that are not wholly different from today. Uh, you know, they're using uh, bar charts and column charts and pie charts and, and uh, word clouds are relatively, well, so word clouds aren't new, but the ability to make them not look weird is, is relatively new with, with sort of algorithmic layout techniques. Um, all of those, like the, the, the individual pieces of the data visualization itself um, I don't really think there's a ton of new stuff to really build around that. I think, uh, you know, there, there's certainly some, some new ones that are kind of the neat. There's some new ones that are more distraction than they are useful. I think like, there's like spider web radial sort of whatever those things are supposed to be. Um, it, some of them I think end up being more, um, you know, quite often they are, they are more, uh, uh, distraction than not. So I think there's sort of a standard toolbox of very effective things that when they're used in a, in a good way, um, they're very responsive. They feel like they've got a lot of depth. They feel like there's, there's more to, there's more to them than just what you see when you first look over the top of them. You know, it's more than just, oh yeah, that line's going up, moving on. There, there's more to them of being able to sort of click on things, hover on things, go find something else, having the ability quite often to like go back and like inspect the original data, maybe even be able to do something with it, curate it, at, you know, add it to a favorite, add it to a project, kind of curate a subset of, of what you're looking at, you're interested in. I think it's the responsiveness and the interactive ability more than any of the new data, you know, anything like the new data visualization stuff. How do you get people to interact with, with, your, with your visualization? Because I, 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 I feel like I created interactive visualizations in the past, and I don't think I did senior management to interact with it. I, I don't know if it scared them or it was complicated or it was a tableau thing, but I, I never found them finding the interaction valuable. Like they would just look at it and go, okay, and then move on. Like I could, I could select states and it would affect all this, and, but they didn't, just didn't seem to do it as a shot of technique. So yeah, so your question was was um, uh, how do I like how do I get people to want to interact with the graph, particularly people uh, uh, who were at you know sort of higher levels of, of of management would would be less likely to sort of spend the time doing that exploration or really found uh, a lot of incremental value in being able to do sort of high granular exploration uh, with people who are at you know people who are sort of uh, senior managerial that's probably true they got a lot of stuff to do. Uh, they kind of need to see things completely at a high level. The cynic in me would say the way to solve that problem is to, uh, whenever something starts, uh, whenever a state of something, you know, whenever you load something up or first look at it, um, if it looks like it already answers a question, it's pretty, ob it's, it's pretty common to think, okay, well, that's the question this thing answers and sort of, you know, let me make sure I understand it, but then moving on. And if, if something, when it starts up, looks like it's capable of answering questions, but in its current state, doesn't answer any questions. Um, depending on sort of how much direction you, you, you give, uh, people will have to kind of go seek that uh, out, have to seek out uh, what question it is they want to answer, and chances are that they're going to be looking at, at different ones. Now that, now that works to varying degrees. Sometimes that works pretty well, sometimes that doesn't work uh, terribly well at, at all. When it's when it's sort of a landscape of like interrelationships and, and that sort of thing that works pretty well. When it's you know when it's something that's that's you know by its nature more hierarchical. That's you know in your, you know your case you're for a company that like is located entirely in North America and so you're you, and you know, let's say you're looking at financial data you're probably going to be able to look at like the entire country and then like states and then like maybe markets and then maybe like individual districts or something like that. Um, I'm pretending I don't know exactly how all of your data works. <laughs> like I didn't work there for. Five, 
six years. Um, but uh, it, it's when things are sort of naturally hierarchical, then the people who have the least amount of time are probably going to start at the highest level and kind of feel like, okay, I'm good. Uh, I think it's the people sort of at the intermediate levels, the people who probably understand uh, the implications uh, to the same degree that you know the, the, the people at sort of the C-suite level will, um, but are trying to find uh, ways where they can literally affect difference, uh, where they can where they can do something, and probably in you know relatively small uh, uh, ways or very pointed ways. Uh, those are the people that are probably going to be doing the most exploration. So, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't expect uh, the people sort of at making the highest level decisions to be looking at the lowest level data, but the people m making the lowest level decisions and, and the people that are going to have to go through and find the, you know, like I said before, there's 15 different things and, and uh, 12 of them don't matter and three of them do. Like, they probably don't have time to look at all 15, but somebody does and then can show the, the sort of three that do. And, and there's confidence that like if they, have, if they have understood that these are the three and like I sort of trust their uh, judgment and capabilities and, and, uh, and move on with the initiatives to do it. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh sure, okay, yeah. So, so I talked about sort of two fundamental, uh, two fundamental areas: the the ability to make things explorable, uh, and the uh, and you know being able to explore uh, data, and the ability to make things uh, more collaborative and be able to do collaborative things. You know, do, be able to collaborate around data. Um, like, how do I bring those together? How, how, how do you bring those together? Well. <clears throat> uh, so I think they, they both sort of have uh, a bit of a similar starting point. I think that's one thing that helps in specifically in the sort of data science world, which is uh, they, we, we've kind of gotten like tiny tastes of each one. The, the, we've, gotten the, we've gotten from the ability to sort of, you know, to have pretty effective static data visualization or, you know, and starting to get a little bit more interactive data visualization. We've started to have the ability to have uh, uh, data visualization, which has really, I think, started to trigger the ability, started to trigger the want to be able to explore uh, uh, using that paradigm. And so I think that's sort of the, the gateway to trying to, you know, to try to add in exploration on top of the visualization element. And then I, I think once you sort of uh, get past, um, once you kind of get past the ability to understand large patterns, data visualization kind of gives you the ability to understand a pattern that just by reading the lines of data you wouldn't be able to get. Once you kind of have the ability to understand those larger patterns, being able to bring that uh, in and bring our own sort of domain expertise into that and be able to uh, fundamentally change what it is you are seeing and, and um, being able to start leveraging other tools that are sort of ancillary to data visualization like networking and and to try to let you know to try to stack um, uh, collaboration on on top of them so the way i would say they uh, i don't think they necessarily have to come together and they certainly don't have to in any any specific project where i think they really can come together is that like the ability to understand things visually it rang so true with people because it was fundamentally a piece of like our psychology, a piece of our humanity. Like it was just the way our brains worked. It was they were made to like understand patterns and find visual patterns incredibly well. And so the sort of inspiration behind that was like, well, what else like are people naturally, you know, really good at doing? And that is like being curious and wanting to go explore things. And, and if you can get, some, if you can sort of attach to someone's interest, uh, that interest will essentially become a currency to get them to work for free for, or, you know, for free work incrementally uh, uh, more toward finding uh, uh, solutions to problems. And uh, that people, uh, it, you know, the, if they feel like they can effectively collaborate, people actually, you know, leverage the sort of social nature uh, of people and, and I think 
that is that the way they come together. I think is through is through uh, interactability and collaboration. So interactability is sort of required to be able to explore. You have to interact with the world to be able to explore it, but not to look at a picture of it really. Um, and so applications sort of are, are a method to become more interactive in that way. You have to be sort of be interactive in order to be able to collaborate because it requires communication, it requires multi-directional communication. And so, uh, you know, reception of a given answer or reception of, of something visual won't necessarily do that. But application, like that's sort of a, that's kind of when you start to get into the application uh, uh, nature of, of things. Yeah. And so I think the two of those together are the reason why, like, you know, you go to the early, very early 2000s, like late 90s, early 2000s, the web 1.0 sort of area. The entire web was like things that you could read or pictures you could look at. And then like the most successful things today are all uh, on, the, on, on the web, are all applications that you interact with, that you socialize with, that you explore. You know, they're, they're like Facebook and that sort of thing, where all, like every, every bit of content is contributed uh, by, by the user base and it's not something that you receive. And so, I, yeah, trying to, trying to learn those lessons and apply them. Yeah, thank you. Oh, wait, which one? Okay. So I like this analogy that you used uh windshield that Okay, thank you. So you said that uh visualization speed uh Yeah. So yeah. So uh, so I mentioned the the uh, to, to redo your question. Uh, so yeah, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the sort of analogy, the sort of dashboard to windshield uh, analogy, and and uh, as you're sort of understanding the difference between kind of the the relatively like static and received information versus a sort of exploratory. Uh, what role do uh, sort of these other visualization technologies, so augmented reality, virtual reality, and kind of things adjacent to that? What role uh, do uh, uh, do they have to play? So, uh, you know, from kind of the cool sci-fi like uh, um, Minority Report um, uh, approach, um, they probably have a pretty big one. And they, that wouldn't ring so true with everyone thinking it was a really neat way to sort of interact with whatever you were doing and wouldn't be, you know, like the primary way that, I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly the way that like it worked in that one. That's the way it worked in Iron Man. That's the way it worked in Skyfall. Like all of these sort of sci-fi approaches to how do you do, whenever, whenever a movie needs to be exciting but still do data analysis, which is kind of a, a, a weird, you know, sort of union of a place to be in, uh, it, it's always in some form of either augmented reality or, or, or virtual uh, uh, reality, and we, you know, if I go back and get to play with the Star Trek thing again, if you look, Star Trek effectively, you know, when it was when, in, in the '60s, showed everybody having uh, portable communication devices, and now we do. And uh, in the '80s, when Next Gen came along, everyone mysteriously had iPads, and now we all have iPads. Like uh, they, uh, you know, the, the the sort of visionaries of of like how will we, how do we wish we could interact with the world. Um, you know, quite often starts out in entertainment because it's the create, you know, sort of the, the most creative people, and especially in science fiction, it's kind of creative people plus nerdiness, um, which you know will likely ring true in this particular room. Um, so I, I think it probably has a pretty big role uh, to to play in it. I don't know exactly what, but I think in a lot of ways, whereas a lot of technologies kind of you know they're they're, they're sort of growing together, where they're on the cusp uh, in the same way that like. Uh, a lot of machine learning technologies are kind of on the cusp to being able to like solve the next major sort of AI uh, grade uh, um, uh, problems in in like a way that's sort of you know and sort of next major step beyond what we sort of understand that kind of AI elements can do now. Uh, that's probably the case with 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 visualization and the ability to uh, to to make it be and you know to to make something make some sort of visualization be sufficiently, I don't think, not realistic is the wrong term, but to, it would be, have a sufficient fidelity that like, it's not in the way of whatever it's trying to represent. The technology is, is, is a facilitator rather than being in the way of whatever it's, you know, whatever it's, it's trying to, uh, uh, to present. 
And in, in so much as that's, so I, I have very little experience in that area. I'm not really personally terribly interested in like VR or AR. It's just not my world, it's not my, not my thing. But for the people who are, um, uh, I think they'll be doing some really interesting uh, things with, with data visualization and, and, and with exploration. And yeah, seemingly, I mean, that making something where it feels like a physical environment kind of, you know, further engages uh, the way that, that, that real exploration like got, you know, sort of invented as being hardwired in our head. So in as much as it is a reflection of like, do, you know, using a paradigm that exists in reality to solve a problem that sort of exists ethereally, uh, I think it will be highly effective in that for sure. Yeah, I just, I won't be the guy who solves that problem. <laughs> How are we doing on time? Everybody, everybody fine? We're coming up on the hour? Like, I'm not, I don't want to keep anybody. Yes, sir. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the data visualizations that I, that that I work with are the ones that sort of I'm talking about. Um, like, sort of how do they how do they kind of keep up with whatever's going on? Are they are they pretty static? Are they event driven? Are they sort of user driven? Uh, you know, do they do they update when when a certain database does or when something happens? Um, I think the cool thing about uh, uh, about Applications, really this, I mean, the, the engines that run data visualizations have largely solved this too. So I'm, I'm not going to claim any, you know, credit in my sort of circle around we solve this specifically. Uh, I think that is, is becoming, um, I, think, I think we are at a point where that's not really uh, uh, necessary to, to worry about independently. We can kind of solve whatever those problems are. So um, if it's pretty static, if it's kind of a, a static state where we need to go explore this you know, thing pretty statically, that's pretty easy to, to accomplish. Um, if, if we need to, you know, if, if it sort of needs to uh, have a, a state that is constantly mutating, so this is a database that's updating, that sort of thing, as, as things happen, whatever those new data is coming in or data is getting curated, whatever. Um, I, I, you know, uh, largely, I think the ability to kind of spread out these pieces where they are, uh, uh, particularly the, the sort of data interactions are kind of microserviced, um, mean, and where we talk, you know, we talk back and forth between them using, um, using like APIs, using, just using networking. I mean, APIs are the methodology, but using networking to talk back and forth between these disparate pieces means that the update of any one effectively uh, updates all of them when it's necessary to know that an update happened. Um, and that can either happen like, hey, next time you use it, it'll be updated, or, or you know, it could be, uh, hey, and, you know, like uh, uh, it can push notifications uh, uh, through where it updates in real time. We've built instances of both, but I think at this sort of the, the, the tech world, the, the sort of the techs, you know, the, the tech stack that is available, the, the the resources that we have, they are pretty good at solving those problems, and we just sort of leverage their their capability uh, to do it in this particular context. And um, beyond that, uh, because all of those tools are available, they're reliable, they work really well. I think it's all around uh, what are the you know what are the needs of the particular application. I think you just get to defer straight to the application. So. Is that it? I think we're basically out of time for the main part. So I'll hang out for a bit if you want to chat afterward. I'll hang out for a bit if you don't want to chat afterward. You, you, you can go and I'll hang out here and I'll eat the rest of the pizza. Um, but thank you very much for coming. Is there any other announcements you may have wanted to make? Any other things you may have wanted to come back next Wednesday uh, to hear about data visualization uh, at, the, uh, at the Python uh, group? Uh, it's always fun. Um, other than that, yeah, thank you very much for uh, coming and I hope to see you another day. Yeah, there it is. <laughs>